This is the Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter, beginning with the first verse. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, and no money in their belts but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed all, that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This is something called The Message. It's an interpretation by Eugene Peterson. It's called The Bible in Contemporary Language. So as we just heard that version in the New Revised Standard Version, I would like to read you that text from The Message. It gives it a little different flavor and may speak to you a little differently. So here we go. And you can follow along in your own Bible and see where it's different. He left there and returned to his hometown. His disciples came along. On the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting place. He made a real hit, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good. They said, how did he get so wise all of a sudden? Get such ability. But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Judas, Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling. And they never got any further. Jesus told them a prophet has little honor in his hometown among his relatives on the streets he played in as a child. Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there. He laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. That's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left and made a circuit of the other villages teaching. Jesus called the twelve to him and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority and power to deal with the evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeals for funds. Keep it simple. And no luxury inns. Get a modest place and be content there until you leave. If you're not welcomed, not listened to, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then they were on the road. They preached with joyful urgency that life can be radically different. Right and left, they sent the demons packing. They brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies, healing their spirits. Brothers and sisters, grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen Christ. That version in the message takes on a little different flavor, doesn't it? Interesting stuff. Two things stuck with me from this gospel text for today. I'm having a little trouble getting past them as I usually do with this text. I've actually used this text in my past, but that's a different story. 
The first part is where Jesus is evidently without honor in his hometown and can't do any deeds of power. The second part is the part where the disciples are told to shake the dust off their sandals. It is an apparent symbolic testimony against those who do not receive their message. Both of these texts have some things to say about what was going on then and what's going on now in our world. If we spend some time thinking about a prophet not having honor in his hometown, we might see a vision of what it is to be known to a point where we're almost known too deeply. I've experienced something like that in my own life. When I was ordained, some of the folks that I have as friends on Facebook were in a state of unbelief. Yeah, go figure. The people I knew when I was in grade school and junior high back in Massachusetts, they'd put on some comments, you're a what? <laughs> like, of an actual church? Yes, of a real church. Wow, we didn't see that coming. No, you didn't. Maybe they knew me to a point where they thought that I was a certain kind of person and could never be anyone else. I would have to say that Jesus taught them different. As we move through life and encounter all the twists and turns that life can bring, we change. We grow and become the person that Jesus leads us to be. We walk by faith and Jesus helps us grow into the person that God created us to be. So the people that we leave behind only know the old us. Some would say those folks know us as we actually are on a deep level, maybe. I would say that they know the old us and not the us that we have become. Those kids I knew back in Massachusetts would be surprised to find the person I've become. I always thought it'd be fun to show up at a school reunion you know, with the collar on. I they could not imagine the person I've become. Therefore, they can't imagine the things that I do or the people that I influence. It's not that I can't do the things I do. It's that they, based on the experiences that we all shared in the past, can't grasp the idea that I do this thing called ministry. And maybe that's what was happening here in our text. Jesus was the victim of preconceived notions. The folks that watched Jesus grow up just couldn't get past who they thought they knew Jesus was. They knew the Jesus that was the little kid. They knew the Jesus that was the carpenter's son. Notice, incidentally, they referred to him as the son of Mary. That's interesting. Kind of scandalous of the day because you never referred to a boy as the son of a mother. It was always the son of a father. So where about Joseph? Where was he? We don't know. Suffice to say that it was a little bit tough to hear them say that he was Mary's son. Why was he identified in this way? We don't really know. Short answer is that Jesus is the son of God. He's not Joseph's son. He's God's boy. Maybe that's all we need to say about that. Maybe that's the subject of another sermon. I digress. For our time together today, let's just concentrate on this preconceived notion of who these folks thought that Jesus was. He was the son of a lowly carpenter. Now, no offense to any carpenters in the world, and I can tell you in today's day and age, you find a good carpenter, they're worth their weight in gold, right? I mean, anybody who's done any kind of home improvement knows that a good carpenter is very tough to find and very valued. We get that now. Back in that time, they were laborers. They were on the bottom kind of, of the social food chain. How then could Jesus do all the things that he did if he was just the carpenter's kid? Not only that, but it says that Jesus could do no deeds of power in that place. Is that because the people around him just couldn't get past those preconceived notions and recognize the real Jesus that now stood before them? I'm a little hesitant to say that Jesus was unable to do those things. I'd rather think that the image that these people had of Jesus prevented them from seeing this real Jesus and receiving who he was and what he did. So that imagery works pretty well with us as well. We go through life and grow over time and become someone that people in our past might not even be able to recognize. They can't see who and what we've become. Their image is tainted by their experience. 
It's hard to accept that people change. It's probably even harder to accept that people are changed by God. But we are. We are changed by God as we go through life. We are molded through our experiences into the people that God needs us to be. He shapes us into that people that he needs us to be in order to get done what he needs us to get done. He equips us and prepares us. And that can confuse people that are stuck in one spot in their perception of who we are. That might be problematic in our relationship with them. Could be. Could be a little tough to get past. If they can't get past their perception of us, there might be some pretty significant roadblocks to them receiving us and what we are sent by God to do in that relationship. That's where that whole shake the dust off thing comes in. When people have a hard time accepting us and what we are doing and what we are saying, it might be time to go. That's kind of what Jesus told the disciples when he sent them out into the world, didn't he? Jesus told his disciples to go out in the world and do the things that they've been called and equipped to do and not worry about how they were going to get it done. Just go do it. If folks don't get it, they don't receive it, then go to the outside of town and shake the dust off your shoes in a symbolic gesture that says, I'm done with you. And I even get rid of the last remnant of my time with you. It's all quite stark, right? I mean, the scary part is where Jesus tells you to go without any stuff, right? Don't take any gear with you. I just got back from a week on the river in a wilderness, right? I mean, we were canoeing and all that kind of stuff. Way out in the middle of Wisconsin, very remote. And I can tell you, it would have been a really tough week if we didn't bring anything with us. The thought of going out into the woods without protection or food or water... Oh, that's frightening. It makes me shudder. It would take a great amount of trust, and I'm not sure that any of us in those canoes had that much trust. We had to gather wood for our fires, and that was hard enough. I can't imagine how hard it would have been to gather our food as well. At least the disciples would have had people that, had, that would feed them. Of course, you know, now that I think of it, maybe it's harder to trust that people would supply what you needed instead of relying on your own devices to gather food, right? Hospitality, I don't know, hard to say. It's enough to say that there would have been a great amount of trust involved, right? What if that trust didn't pan out? What were they gonna do if the hospitality didn't come through? Jesus told them to move on. If they weren't taken care of and not supported and their message wasn't received, they were to just move on, as, Jean, as Eugene Peterson says, shrug your shoulders and take off. Leave all the traces of that community behind. Again, they were to trust that God would lead them where they needed to go and give them what they needed in order to get done what God had led them and called them to do. Trust. Do we see things like this in our own lives? Well, for sure, we do, right? The only thing that's tough here is to trust that you can move on and shake the dust off and that God will lead you where you're called to be next, right? I mean, that can be really tough. It's tough to let, to let God take over. It really is. Remember that song, Jesus Take the Wheel? Has anybody heard this? I used this last night. Only one person raised their hand. Okay, Google it. Jesus Take the Wheel. It's a great song. The unfortunate thing is Jesus Take the Wheel often leads you into a car crash. I get that. But I also get that God often leads us to take a risk and trust Him and go where He leads us to go. Through prayer and listening, we can experience some really great relationships along the way. I can testify to that for hours. We can be led into a community where we are listened to and respected for who we are and what God is calling us to say and do. It says in the text, that Jesus is the one who granted them the authority and the ability to get that work done. Trust. So we can take some pretty great confidence from a text like this, that Jesus is equipping us to be who he knows we can be and do what he knows we can do. Jesus is changing us to the point where the old us is completely gone. Even so much that our old self is unrecognizable to those in our past. 
People around us are surprised at who we have become in Christ. We say it all the time. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old doesn't recognize us. The new embraces us. Even if they don't, Jesus tells us that's okay. Move on to the places and people that do embrace you. Jesus sends us. Jesus goes with us. Jesus equips us. Jesus empowers us. We can do all things through Jesus who gives us strength. Amen.